you. At ServiceNow Knowledge 14 is sponsored by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to San Francisco. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We're here live at the Moscone Center. This is day three of ServiceNow Knowledge. Last night was the big customer event. It was at the Fort Mason, a taste of San Francisco. They had a little you know, food courts all over the, the Fort Mason uh, venue. It was fantastic. Music was, was blasting. Had to be, you know, most of the 6,600 customers were there enjoying uh, just an awesome event. Big, a lot of excitement here. Uh, Dan McGee is with us, just coming off the keynote. He's the Senior Vice President of Engineering and Cloud Operations at ServiceNow. Uh, Dan, welcome to theCUBE. How do you feel? Feel great. Yeah. Great Thanks, job. You had, a, you had a packed house given that, uh, that you had the big party last night. Yeah, yeah we uh, told a lot of people what we were going to talk about and it seemed like there was a lot of interest in yeah. it. So I was happy you to must, see all that. You must have been a little nervous, right? Oh, they gave you the Thursday morning, but uh, yeah. It was, Surprisingly uh, not. You know, I was anxious to tell the story and uh, so I had fun. Yeah, it was good. So the cloud is a scary place. I'm told. <laughs> yeah, well, it can be, it can be. Well, that's kind of how your presentation started, right? You had this you know, video going on, and, and uh, I really liked sort of the way you framed it. Uh, but so why, why uh, is, is the cloud a scary place for a lot of people? And let's get into what you guys are doing about it. Yeah, well, I think our first point was that you know, not all clouds are the same. People have different sort of design points. There's you know, the consumer space that is targeting for sort of one thing, which is getting eyeballs to their location, and then there's the departmental clouds like Salesforce and others that are fundamentally focused on just a piece of the enterprise, and then there's the enterprise class clouds where having that stuff up and working all the time is, is the most important. So that's kind of where it all starts. And then the second thing is just fundamentally truth in advertising, right? We're, we really believe strongly in reflecting what the real availability is for customers uh, real time, not some sort of fictitious number that we all tell ourselves about how things are working. We really want our numbers to reflect what customers are experiencing. Yeah, we're going to talk about that some more. So, okay, so the consumer cloud, a lot of it's free. So if it's down, you know, eh. Um, uh, and or a lot of even, you know, sort of low-end clouds that you pay for, it's a lot of times the SLA is, hey, we'll do our best, and if we don't, you can send us an email, right. and we might get back to you, you know, sooner or later. You made a point that the departmental clouds, you know, it's okay if your CRM is down for a little bit on the weekend. Yeah. Because you said the sales guys are out, out golfing or whatever yeah. they're doing, but they're not like hardcore, right. you know, banging away. But your customers are. That's right. Yeah, you know, uh, when I first started working at ServiceNow, you know, that was a very early lesson. Folks are using our system in mission critical applications and they can't afford for the system to be down any time of the day. A lot of folks or a lot of uh, cloud providers try to hide behind the, well, we'll take the system down at 2 a.m. on Saturday. Well, you know, where it's 2 a.m. on Saturday in New York, it's not 2 a.m. on Saturday in, you know, Sydney, Australia. And so that just doesn't work for the enterprise uh, class providers. You said you have one care provider who actually utilizes service now at the, the bedside. Yeah, they do. In fact, that's where I learned that lesson the, the most clearly. Uh, you know, when you're down, we can't. We have to find a different way to provide care uh, to our patients. Well, Dan, is the, is the expected uh, uptime for cloud different than people expect from their own enterprise internal IT? Because do they, so. they, they yeah. have extern, you know, internal SLAs that they have to maintain the number of nines that you're expected to do? You know, I don't think so. I, you know, I, I think the end users in the enterprise, fundamentally, they just get really annoyed when they want to use it and they can't use it. it. It's really that simple. So it's black and white for them. If the system's down, they're angry. If it's up, everything's going fine. So, you know, I, I don't think there's, I don't think you can get good enough in terms of availability for us that are all trying to do our jobs. For example, right now, if we're trying to do this interview and the lights went out or your computer went out, you know, that would be arguably a mission critical situation. Right, you right. You wouldn't be very tolerant of it. It's just, it's just interesting in terms of the changing expectations because I've used Salesforce in a past life and you know, you get the little notice every right. whatever, you know, we're going to be down from right. X to Y and right. you don't really think much about it because it always comes up at some frequency. So that's a very different kind of expectation setting than, right. you know, being mission critical or on that's the finance exactly side right. or. And, and furthermore, you know, they, they've set the expectation that when they give you that notice, it's not negotiable because, and, they, and it can't be negotiable for them because they have a multi-tenant architecture. They have to take hundreds of customers down at the same time. They can't be having individual conversations because there's no way you're going to get 500 people to agree on when you can take an outage. ServiceNow's architecture, which is single instance, we, we actually can have that conversation with customers. If we say, you know, we're going to do some sort of planned maintenance and it's going to create a glitch for you, and they're going to say, hey, not this week, can we do it next Monday? We can actually accommodate that request because of our architecture. Okay, so now let me play a little skeptic here. So somebody might say, all right, well, 
that's fine, Dan. I, I, I buy that, but you know, you're know, you comparing. We're going to do some comparisons in a, in a little second, but you're talking about Amazon's massive scale, hundreds of thousands of customers. You guys only have 2,000 customers. I mean, what, you know, we're talking about a much smaller scale. Isn't it easier for you to sort of deliver those services? So. Yeah, well, you know, the reality of it is, uh, you know, we don't have a button on our website that, sa that says, you know, if you don't like the fact that we're going to do a maintenance window, you know, click that and, and we'll automatically change it. You know, customers have to make the effort to call us and contact us. Uh, it is effort, but it's an effort that we're actually able to do. That's the big thing. We can do it, whereas other folks out there that have these multi-tenant architectures, they don't even have the choice. Even if they wanted to do it, they can't. Yeah, now, now let's talk, so let's talk about scale. Sort of tongue in cheek there saying you guys a couple thousand customers, but, but you have 12 million users, right? So a very large number, average of over 5,000 yeah. users per customer, yeah. right? So that's your scale, that's where you're at today, and you're growing you know, very rapidly. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I think that's, again, just sort of a demonstration of once this product gets deployed at a particular company, it, it grows like a weed. It is so easy to use and so easy for people to put applications together. The, the penetration in an account grows like wildfire, and I think that's just a, a testament to how easy it is to generate applications, get them up live, and get them going. So let's talk some more uh, data points. You have 16 data centers. Um, and they're replicated, right? Yes. Uh, so they're proximate, uh, and you do that because of your ar architectural approach of not being multi-tenant is one reason, right? And you're able to fail over Actually, very Actually, that's more driven by customers' desire to have their data in their region. So the data sovereignty issue, for example, the best example is the Swiss banks, right? Swiss mm -hmm. banks, there's a Swiss finance law where the data can't leave the country, and so we have a replica pair of data centers in Zurich and in Geneva, and that satisfies their requirement. That's really more the drive for having replica data centers in the region. Now, isn't that a, a, a similar law, for instance, I have to ask you this, is, is, is there a similar law in Germany, but you can, you cover, how do you cover Germany? Do you just cover it with some other EU, EU country, and that suffices, or? Yeah, to, to date, the German folks are served out of our Amsterdam and London data and that's centers. Cool. That, and that's cool. And that so works. far, that's working fine. I, you know, world's always changing, and, but, but the point of the matter is, we, we have an architecture that treats all these data centers the same. They're managed with one network operations center. They're managed with the one incident process I described today. So if we do decide we need to put a couple of data centers in Germany and it's financially viable for us to do so, we can do that. It's not a re-architecture. It's not mm -hmm. a two-year exercise. Uh, it's not a promise we're going to get it done in a year and then get it done in five. Uh, it's something we can do. And you've got a pretty, pretty large CMDB. We right? do. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so our CMDB, like uh, most of our customers, populates and, and holds all the data associated with our cloud. We can map directly from a customer instance all the way through all the various networking components and hardware components, all the way down to the disk drives if we need to, so we know what is dependent on what. If a customer has an issue with their service, we can very quickly figure out where the problem is. Likewise, on the other extreme, if we have a problem at the very lowest layer, we can quickly figure out what service levels are, are being impacted and get after it very quickly. All of our time is spent actually remediating the issue or actually doing a failover. We spend very little time sort of hunting for what the problem is. Okay, uh, a couple other quick stats. You did 24,000 instances at No14 just to, to, to support this event, and you did it with essentially one person. You said it's really two people, but somebody right, had a lead, right, so it's right. really one FTE. Uh, 2.5 million individual entries in this uh, CMDB, so right. talking about 3.6 billion transactions per month. Yeah. Yeah, so big numbers. I think you know they're demonstrating a couple of things. On the CMDB side, it's demonstrating not only how well articulated our infrastructure is, but it's showing customers how articulated their infrastructure can be. They can run their operation with ServiceNow just like we run our operation with ServiceNow and make life a lot easier. On the scale side, it shows transaction rate is really the amazing thing about ServiceNow and our ability to scale transactions. As we talked about in the keynote, we're not really that storage centric of an application. People are not storing gobs and gobs and gobs of petabytes in our stuff, but they are doing sort of 3x the transaction rate per customer of anybody else out there. And our ability to actually deliver that without customers even having to worry about it is one of the great things about ServiceNow. All right, so we're in a little tight on time, so I want to get into the, really the heart of what I wanted to talk about today. Anybody who's followed Wikibon and SiliconANGLE over the years knows that we've been oftentimes talking about you know, when somebody talks about five nines or six nines, that it's, it's irrelevant. What matters is what the user sees, and we're going to yeah. talk about that a little bit. So you put up a chart. Well, so for, let's start. What is a nine? Let me yeah. talk about five, five nines, four nines, two nines. What's a nine? Yeah, so 99.99% uh, availability means basically you have five minutes of downtime a month. 
so actually, I think it's five nines is, is, is that. So 99.999 yeah. is five minutes of downtime five, five a month. Five minutes a month. Yeah. Okay. So doesn't sound like much. Doesn't sound like much unless you're doing an interview right here and your system goes down for five minutes. And That's it means a lot problem. to you. That's a big problem. Yeah, so it, it, it matters. It always does. There's, you know, 100% is what people expect. Okay, and then you shared some data. I, I, I apologize not having this chart for our audience, but I'll sort of read it off. Uh, I took a snapshot, or actually somebody sent me a snapshot. So you're at uh, 99.995 average uptime. Yeah. That's the number. Now we compared that to, you compared that to Salesforce, which is 99.8, Workday 99.5. That's one of those departmental clouds. We don't have to go through them all. NetSuite actually pretty good, 99.6, and Amazon 99.5. Uh, but your other point was, that's only part of the story. Yeah. You have to include planned downtime. So that's unplanned downtime. Right. right? What's what about? plan downtime, and you guys, very low, right? Six hours right. compared to the other guys. Right. Some as high as 68 hours or over 100 hours. That's per quarter, right? Yeah, and that's back to, again, that architecture stuff, right? So we are a single instance architecture, which means we routinely fail somebody over from their primary to their backup in order to perform maintenance on the primary side. So mm -hmm. the, the only downtime they're going to experience is the time invoked during that failover, which is a very short period of time. The other folks out there that are multi-tenant, doing that failover is a very risky and a very scary thing. And in fact, some of those companies don't do it as a result. They'll tell you they have a high availability design, but they really don't use it because it's such a scary factor. So with, they have to take these big outages every week to go do maintenance on stuff and then bring it all back up. And then the other, the other two key metrics, RTO and RPO, for those of you who don't know what they mean, recovery time objective, recovery point objective. Recovery time objective is how long it takes to get the application back up and running. Recovery point objective is how much data you're actually going to lose in, in, right. in hours, essentially. Right. And your, your R, RTO was two hours, and your RPO uh, is one hour. Uh, and pretty much everybody else, well, Workday was an hour for R, RPO. A lot of people aren't published. But on RTO, recovery time objective, we're talking 12 hours. The other guys aren't published. Amazon Glacier, I'll poke at them. That's, the, that's their archiving service. That could be, who knows, weeks, months. Yeah. But, but, but you're talking about a pretty tight RTO and RPO. Yeah, the RPO is kind of a funny one, but let me first talk about RTO. Yeah, okay. So RTO is the one that really matters. That's how long am I going to be down when I have an outage, right? And again, as I was talking about a second ago, because we will fail you over, your downtime with us is actually quite fast. Those other guys have to do fix in place. So their recovery time objective is either 12 hours or greater or not even published, where we're able to get you back up and running in minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a difference. Then you get to the recovery point objective where they have a similar time to us, but it's kind of a goofy time because if they're going to be down for 12 hours and you're not able to write new data to the system, how could they say they've got a recovery point objective less than 12 hours? Yeah, right. Okay, and then now, this is the real exciting piece. Let's talk about your real availability dashboard. So you guys say, okay, you've been reporting like everybody else has been reporting, uh, which is essentially, um, if I ping right. the server, right. it, it's up. That's right. But you guys are changing that mentality. Talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's ours. So you know, we're a very customer-centric organization, and so it, it always really bothered us that we would sort of show customers, you know, hey, we're 99 point whatever percent availability, and some of them would roll their eyes and say, well, no, you're not. Well, why not? Well, we have these other issues too. So we're, we're taking that head on. Our, the way we are now going to talk about availability is actually the true customer experience of availability. And so that includes the ping thing that we talked about, but it also includes software errors on our part or performance problems that prevent us from actually delivering the service. You see this in other companies' products where they'll say, you know, stand by for technical difficulties or page won't load. That's a situation where they were able to ping the system, but it wasn't actually able to deliver value. But we're not going to stop there. We're also going to reflect third-party network issues and even customer issues that they've actually done to create an outage in the instance or their inability to actually access the instance. So when a customer goes to their personalized availability dashboard at ServiceNow, which by the way is something only we can do because we are single instance, the other guys that have availability dashboards, they're talking about the whole family of people that are on the same database. But when they go to our, da our dashboard, it's going to reflect their real experience with the product, not ours. Yeah, so in the analyst meeting on Monday, you used that example of, you know, check back later, we can't get to the application right now. You said, is this, is this up? And yeah. then I yelled out, no! And yeah. you said, well, that was you. <laughs> but, but in reality, you know, it would be measured as, as not as downtime, it would be by most, but in your, in your metric, it would be measured as down. If my internet's down, same thing, right? Any reason that I can't get to the application. That's exactly right. And in fact, if you just wake up today and say you're mad at something and you want to file a P1, it's going to get reflected there as well. Yeah, so, okay. so you know, it's, it's your data. Uh, it, it, 
It's, it's, a, it's the collective experience that you actually are feeling. So even if it's not your fault, essentially. That's you're, exactly you're, right. You're measuring it. That's, that's exactly the key. Right. And because that's the, that, that, to an end user, that's where the value is. Now, you, you showed the real availability dashboard. You showed a demo, and, and I wrote down 99.97. Uh, that one, was one customer example. Right. Is that right? right? That's the example we showed today. Yeah. yeah. So will you begin, uh, so now you're going you're gonna to expose that on a customer by customer basis? Will you expose it, that? It's there today. Any customer can go to their home page, which you know has been there forever. It's where they would go and file incidents and do some of the other things we showed in the demo. But now on their home page, it's actually their personalized availability dashboard. It's because we have the CMDB, because we map every instance to every customer, it's a very easy thing for us to produce. And it's there, and it's live, and it's real time. OK, um, we got to go, but I got one last, last word here. Um, I'm nervous if I'm a prospect. I'm nervous about security. Um, can you definitively say that your security is going to be better than my on-premise security for no, most customers? No, I can't, I can't. But what I would like to volunteer is, let's have a discussion, right? Let's compare what we do for security with what you do for security, customer does for security, and then let's make a joint decision. The same posture that we just described around customer availability, where we're going to be very transparent, very forthright, we're going to be a partner with our customers, we are applying the same sort of philosophy to security. We're not going to claim that we're better than anybody, but I think we do have a simpler problem to solve than many of our customers. I made the point in the keynote that we have a very homogenous infrastructure. We do one thing. We host ServiceNow applications. Many of our customers are hosting thousands and thousands of applications throughout their infrastructure. What that means to me is we probably have fewer opportunities to get tripped up than some of our customers do. But ultimately, it's a customer's decision. They need to be comfortable with what they're going to put in our cloud. Let's be educated. Let's talk about what we have and then make the call. Yeah, I like that answer. It's not a, I always ask that question. And, and, and I think the, the right response is let's have that conversation. You really, you, you can't say one's better than the other. No. You have to have a, right. a detailed, deep discussion about it. And it's got to be transparent. It's got to be auditable, you know, right. ideally. Right. All right, Dan, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Great, Great to see you. Nice Appreciate job today. It. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. We're live. This is theCUBE from Knowledge14. We'll be right back.